What's up, good people? Welcome to another episode of Talk of the Shore. My name is Raylan Wardlaw. And I'm Langston Fraser. Yo, we're back another week, another episode. What's another, up, man? I'm chilling. I'm chilling. Yeah. Happy I, uh, happy uh, Friday, man. We feel good? Yeah, I feel good. Uh, well, I will say this, you know, at, at the time of this recording, it's April 15th. Uh, shout out to all my accounting friends, tax day. Tax day. I took care of that a while ago, though. You know, get on it early, get your money back, and use it for something good, not something bad. Add it to your stimulus check, and then yep. you can, you know, go have fun and put also, it in your savings. Hopefully, put a little bit in your savings. But uh, as always, uh, if you didn't, excuse me, if you didn't listen to last week's episode uh, with Akani Salako, uh, soon to be doctor, soon to be doctor, uh, physical therapy, uh, talked about a wide range of things, his basketball playing career. His journey here at uh, Eastern Shore So uh, make sure you go check that out Yeah, and he has a fitness company too So Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've, I've worked out with Akani once before And uh, still, I was looking at his Instagram today He's still, he's, he's getting it in Support, and so, a, support a black business so Supporting yeah. the black business, absolutely that's what, that's what it's all about For sure, but you know how we get started Yo, you know I got started. an HBCU fact of the day Let's go. Of course, every day on this podcast It's, it's a Black History Month fact A fact for you to learn something mm-hmm. something new So I got a good fact for you All right. Here's, here's the question Who was the first HBCU to win an NCAA championship? I do not know well, I have the answer for you. Winston-Salem State University, also known as WSSU, mm-hmm. uh, won the men's uh, basketball team. Their basketball team in uh, 1967 won the NCAA Division II championship, um, and they were led by Basketball Hall of Famer Earl mm-hmm. Monroe. On the basketball court and on the bench, uh, head coach Clarence Big House Gaines okay. was in charge of the crew. So that's your uh, HBC fact of the day. That, that name Earl Monroe means uh, a little bit. First of all, if you've seen the movie He Got Game, Jesus Shuttlesworth was named after Earl Monroe, Black exactly. Jesus, not, you know, the holy. Right. Uh, but also Earl Monroe, my dad, like, see, my dad, my dad is... is He's he's not like one of most people our age. Like Michael Jordan is nah. My dad's an old school cat, right. so uh, you know, Oscar Robinson is his guy. Like right. there's nobody topping Oscar Robinson. How my dad feels about him, obviously Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but Earl Monroe. My dad used to tell me about Earl Monroe, and he said, uh, you know, Earl Monroe's with the bullets. I didn't even know what the bullets meant at the right. time because you know I was. And then he was saying Baltimore Bullets, so that's even, yeah, that's that's, even further that's, back. That's he was like, Baltimore Bullets, Earl Monroe, he was getting buckets. But he said, man, when they put him up there with Walt Frazier and the Knicks, he said, that he said Earl Monroe, that was the reason the Knicks got a, another championship. And coincidentally, that is the last time the Knicks won a championship. I think it was 1973. So well, What happened, folks? Come on. The Knicks are the Knicks. The Knicks actually don't have a bad team this year, though. I like the way they're playing. But uh, yeah, man, Earl Monroe. That means that that name rings a bell. Means a lot. Earl the Pearl. My dad was a big Earl Monroe fan. Also, yeah, April fifteenth, me... too. You know, another little. It's not an HBCU fact, but just Black History. Black this History. Is, this is also the uh, anniversary of Jackie Robinson. There we go. Looking the color barrier. So in baseball. And in, in baseball in nineteen forty seven. So if you remember April fifteenth, just don't think about Tax Day. Think about Jackie Robinson too. There we go. There's a positive to a negative. Absolutely. <laughs> if tax day is a negative for you, you need to get yourself <laughs> together. So uh, now we're about to introduce our guest, another special guest. Special you know, we, guest. We've had, we've had quite a few head coaches uh, here. We started off with Trevor Callum was our first guest. He was a head coach, and we're just making our way down the list. And so we had, we had the women's. Had the women's. Head basketball coach. Now we have the men's head basketball coach here for the Hawks, Jason Crafton. What's up, Jay? What's up, guys? Good to be here. Talk of the show, man. Big time. Appreciate welcome, you guys welcome. Me. Man, thank you for thank you for coming on. This is this has been a couple weeks in the making. You know, busy man right here. Busy this is man. a busy man right here. You know, he's he's you gotta book this man weeks <laughs> weeks out. Weeks out. So uh coach, um, you know, you you, you said you, you know, feel me with the show a little bit. So uh we start the show off asking each person, where are they from? Where where what are the roots of Jason Kraft? <laughs> I got roots everywhere. <laughs> I know, but if somebody, you know, I got roots everywhere. Yeah. It all started uh, born in Brooklyn, New York. Mm-hmm. Um, then we moved to Long Island when I was like four or five years old, and uh, grew up on Long Island. 
and uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Westchester County, Rockland County um, area. And some people consider it upstate, but it's not really like upstate like Buffalo. All right, it's like that. barely upstate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so about 45 minutes outside the city. Um, but I make, I make my rounds between New York, the Philly area, and Maryland throughout my time. But okay. New York is, is, so is so Brooklyn Brooklyn <laughs> is like home base for you. Brooklyn slash Long, Long Island. Island is Long. probably more home. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, New York, we uh, I'm kind of attached to a little bit of every part of New York. <laughs> All right. <laughs> in some way, so so <laughs> New York, Long Island area, break it down for me in three words and why. Describe where you're from. Yeah. yeah. Three New words. York. Oh, man. Sum it up in three words. It's, it's, it's a toughie. Family. Okay. And, you know, grind. Um, relationships. Oh, family <laughs> grind and relationships. That's what's up. And he, and he, yeah, and he yeah. didn't, and he didn't dash. He didn't dash. We didn't dash. We, 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 actually, we've, Mari Carver started, we, we've been on a good run of like people not hyphenating words right. pretty much. So that's yeah. good. So why would you uh, describe, you know, where you came from and kind of in those three words? I think family, because when you play basketball in New York, it's a, it's a family, <laughs> you know, and, and, and no matter, it's just everybody kind of knows each other. Uh, I say grind because there's a certain grind that comes from being a New Yorker, no matter where you're from. If you're from the city, there's a certain type of grind. If you're from Long Island, there's a grind that kind of matches the grind of the city grind. And then relationships is just is huge because in New York, it, you know, it kind of ties in with that family aspect in terms of you just kind of just always just building relationships you know I come from an era we played outdoor basketball so we were you know at the parks and you kind of knew everybody at these parks and and then you went to the other parks with your crew and you just constantly were building relationships and that's kind of carried over you know into how we do things in coaching so uh, sure. Family, grind, relationships. That's nice. what's up. <laughs> New York is a unique place. It really is. Yeah, it yeah. really is. So you are in your, we'll say second year, <laughs> second season <laughs> slash, slash. You know what I mean? Yeah. Asterisk. Yeah, yeah. You know, asterisk a little bit because we, you know, we decided not to play this year. But after two years here at uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, you know, kind of tell us how you know you got to this position. Just yeah. what what you know from. Those streets of Long Island, Brooklyn, <laughs> all over Pennsylvania, wherever you were. Yeah. yeah. And uh, kind of how you get to this point. You know, just grinding over the years, you know, started the career um, coaching basketball at Villanova University with, with Jay Wright. You know, after I finished playing, I uh, played Division two ball in, in New York, a school called Nyack College, and uh, always wanted to get into coaching. And that was what I wanted to do. Like any other player that wants to play professionally, when it didn't happen, it was like, what's next? <laughs> and so I was always kind of grinding to try to get myself in the coaching business. And uh, funny story is that how I met Jay Wright, <laughs> it was I was actually kind of, you could say I was stalking uh, <laughs> Coach Wright <laughs> at Final Fours when I was a college student saving up money and I would I would work Villanova camps in the summertime. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I always knew where he would be. <laughs> so wherever Jay Wright was, I was, you know, and I found my way to the Final Four and and found my way to his hotel lobby and just kind of waited. And he would see me everywhere and just like, you really want to get in the business, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, that's why I started my career, video coordinator there for two years, had some great guys, coached some great players, got a chance to learn a lot from him, and then went to the Naval Academy and was there for seven years, um, four as an assistant, three as an associate head coach, then went back to my alma mater, Nyack College, where I was the head coach there for six years, and then got an opportunity to be a part of the Philadelphia 76ers organization, did some player development with the Sixers, and did some uh, was an assistant coach with the G League team. And then found my way uh, as the head coach of Maryland Eastern Shore. Ironically, 12 years prior, I had interviewed for the job with Mr. Davidson, who I also stalked <laughs> at the MEAC tournament when I was an assistant at the Naval Academy. So a lot of my career consists of stalking <laughs> and finding ways to get in. And uh, so that was a pretty cool when when I, I got this opportunity it was like coming full circle. Very cool. Very we cool. just say maybe not stalking, just putting yourself in the proper place. Yeah, it's called just uh, putting uh, persistence. Yes, yeah. yeah. what it is. Stalking. <laughs> <laughs> you said healthy, it, not us. A healthy stalking. A healthy stalk. A healthy stalk. A healthy stalk for sure. But uh, so now that you've been here for. Two years, uh, one season plan, one not. What uh, you know, what are your overall like feelings of like, what do you feel like Medley Eastern Shore is and what we you know can be in the future? Yeah, I, I think everybody that comes through the campus, you know, sees the promise here. You know, sees the great campus, sees the great facilities. You, you know, 
And then it, it, what makes it a hard job is that there's no real basketball tradition. You know, there's no real reference point to saying like, hey, this was the team that got it done, <laughs> you know, in the Division One era. So mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge is just creating success here, you, you know, and it's something that we're striving to do together and, and work in conjunction with our administration and work with the community to find a way to build a basketball program here that really has never been done. You look at the last 30 years, there's only been two winning seasons. So um, we're just looking to creatively and uh, energetically find new ways to, to cultivate a winning culture here. We know it's going to take time, but I think we got great people here. I think we got great facilities. And I think we have a surrounding community that's hungry for a winning basketball program. Um, so even with the step back of not playing this year, uh, we're still very intentional in trying to push this, fo this program forward. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of what we're doing on our daily grind. For sure. Nice. And so as you, you know, going back to grind, I just thought about it. going back to grind, <laughs> New York, it's in you. So um, outside of coaching, like, what do you, you know, what are some fun facts about Jason Crafton? You know, I know, you know, you're, you're a basketball rat, yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? So, yeah. but what, you know, what outside of the game do you say, hey, this is, you know, a little slight getaway for me? Well, I recently tore my shoulder, yeah. <laughs> so I got to get shoulder surgery in a couple of weeks. Um, I should have my sling on right now, but I got to get it moving a little bit today. Yeah. But um, uh, I like to work out. You know, I, I stay actively fit. Um, boxing I took up, which probably messed my labrum up. <laughs> that probably <laughs> added to the drama with my arm. Uh -huh. But um, I like to read. I'm um, heavy into broadcasting and doing. I actually went to school for radio and broadcasting, so I enjoy doing that. So I love seeing what you guys are doing with the show. Great setup. Um, shout out to you guys on the success of the show. So um, those are little things. I like to travel. I salsa dance a little bit, you know. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> all right. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. All right, you know, a little salsa. I mean, I, I know, I, I know what the steps are. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> but if you get somebody that's real, real good, then you know, yeah, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna fall off, but. <laughs> I like that, you know what I mean? Good Just a deal. something, something. I'm a street salsa dancer. Street uh, salsa yes. dancer. Not ballroom. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, it's, it's both got salsa in it. Right. right. You know, both both got salsa in it, for sure. <laughs> right. Now I'm gonna add just a corny question. Do you like chips and salsa? Why you why you salsa? <laughs> that is very corny, Langston. But of course I like chips and salsa. Good. <laughs> Who doesn't like chips and I'm salsa? I'm a guacamole guy myself. <laughs> hey, I make a mean guacamole. You make guacamole? I love guacamole and I make a mean guacamole. That's what's up. That is what's up. Learn something new every day. Yeah, exactly. Learn something new every day. Good deal. Good deal. So let's go Lace, back Lace to kind of a lot of qualities though. A lot, a lot of eclectic, a lot of yeah, different types right. of things. You could just follow on Instagram. I'm shouting out your Instagram right now. There we go. Line, Wait, I, yeah, I got I got all everything on my Instagram. The adventures. Yeah, man. Got <laughs> but but let's let's go back to kind of the origin story. How did you get into basketball? What made you pick the sport of basketball um, that kind of led you to your kind of professional career and your playing career in college? I wasn't any good in football, so I wanted to try something different. <laughs> <laughs> I played two seasons of football and had two two career touchdowns. So. Um, Good way to go out. told me the football thing wasn't, wasn't happening. Yeah. Um, but I switched over to basketball. And what I liked about basketball, um, I, I can't even describe it. It just was like the, the being at the park, you, you know, just, just playing with your friends. And um, it was just – I just enjoyed it. I just enjoyed the game. It was something about just the sound of the ball going through the net, you know, just, just playing pickup and, you know, not wanting to lose and, and just, just the camaraderie with your buddies and everything. You know, I, I still come from that last era that still, like I said, played outside and enjoyed that and rode bikes and went from park to yep. park and, you know, played hoop it up three on three tournaments, you know, and, and, and saved your money up to get in and, and was mad if you didn't win. You know, you wanted the prize. So that that's kind of, you know, just kind of how I got into basketball. And then, you know, playing the game more and more, developed a love for the game. And then, getting cut from a team here or not getting the playing time I might have wanted, you know, encouraged and drove me to wanting to work harder, you know, to become a better player, get up early, stay late, you know, and do all those things, take in weight training. And then it became a mission <laughs> to be the best. And then when the basketball stopped in terms of playing, then I wanted to really be aggressive and to get into coaching and kind of keep that kind of edge and that kind of adrenaline rush and uh, still active in, in, the, in the blood flow. Very cool. Very cool. So what would you say is, like, the, I guess, main difference uh, between, like, the feeling mm -hmm. of playing in a big game versus coaching in a big game? It's nothing like playing in a big game. I still get cold sweats, <laughs> like, on remembering <laughs> moments where I 
where I maybe missed a free throw 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, yeah, it might be yeah. a nine, nine-year-old PAL game. <laughs> you know, it's like, and uh, I, I still remember every big moment of every basketball game I ever played in. Um, you know, I still wear the championship ring from my, my college days when we won the championship in 99, the only conference championship in school history. <laughs> hey, there we <laughs> and, go. Uh, went to the national tournament. But there's nothing like playing, you, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure every coach would tell you that. You know, I think even when we win games, it's, it's for the players because we want them to feel that. You know, we want them to just understand the kind of brotherhood you get from having success in sports. Like when you win a championship with your brothers, it, it's something that this it's – it's for the kids, you know. Yeah. It's, right. So we do this thing in coaching. It's really to help uh, young people grow, mature as men, and to be able to have the type of experiences we had growing up and to be able to cultivate relationships that they'll have for the rest of their lives. You want their teammates to come to their weddings. You want them to be, you know, we want them to have the type of relationships that are forever. So nothing compares to it. Um, it's not the same rush. It is a rush, but it's not It's not comparable. Right. Are you Are you living through your, your student-athletes at all? You know, those game-winning shots or you kind of the plays? Would you imagine yourself in their shoes? You're still a pretty young coach, so you're mm-hmm. still kind of anything that you didn't get to try on the court yourself physically, you know, getting to put that and implementing it into your coaching style. Uh, that's a great question. I don't really think I live through them. Uh, my time is up. I, I think I kind of live for them if I was, you know, in terms of trying to give empower them with the tools that they need to. To, to do things uh, at a higher level. You know, somebody when I was young kind of grabbed me, snatched me up, and showed me the right way to do things. And, and basketball was a driving force, and it kept me, you know, focused. It kept me out of trouble. And we try to do the same things with our guys, you know, through basketball. So I look at it really as working for them and trying to keep them on track to being better men, better people, college graduates one day, and leaders in society. Um, You've been kind of around the coaching game for you know, since the early 2000s. Uh, What about the game from your perspective as a coach versus what you think maybe Jay Wright at Villanova or what you said at Naval Academy just as far as scheme and things of that nature is a lot different now based on how the game has kind of evolved? Game's changing a lot, you know. It's, it's becoming. We kind of started the four guard thing back at Villanova. Yo, I I told you before, yo, I loved I loved that Nova squad, man. Yeah. Allen Ray was my guy. Yeah, that was yeah. my guy, Allen Ray. The funny thing about it is, people don't realize that that all happened because of injuries. So that year, Jason Frazier um, broke his wrist, um, and he was out. We were in the NCAA tournament. Jason Frazier goes down. Curtis Sumter against Florida um, in the first or second round game uh, tears his ACL. So we're literally in the hotel room till like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning as a coaching staff, and we're just trying to figure out. And we're, we're putting different lineups like on paper and on the board, and and Freddie Hill was sitting in there. Freddie Hill was uh, an assistant coach back then and ended up being the head coach at Rutgers for a long time. And he said, why not play Randy Foy at the four? And Randy was like a 6'3 kind of combo guy, <laughs> you know. And we were bringing Kyle Lowry off the bench, and we like, start Kyle at the one, put Mike Nardi at the two, Allen Ray at the three and six foot three Randy Foy at the four and then play Will Sheridan or any of our front court guys at the five. And everybody was kind of sitting there like, that's small. <laughs> you know, that's like really, really small, <laughs> you know. And uh, and Freddie's I- idea was let's just put our best players on the floor. Mm-hmm. And uh, Coach Wright was like, hey, and we kind of developed a formula for success in terms of how to do that. He called it TNT tempo negates turnovers so we kind of held the ball put people in the right spots at the right time and uh the rest was history so we kind of started that four guard thing and i think that's evolved now (laughs) you know the four round one to now even five out now bigs don't want to post up anymore (laughs) you know so the game is kind of you know changing to a more of a three-point shooting fast flowing spread offense type game um and less of a power basketball i kind of got in the big east when it was still some power basketball, still some bigs, still some bruisers, and, and things like that. So I think that's the biggest evolution of the game. And, and the way defense is played now. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. touch anybody. Yeah. You know, it's not as physical the way the refs call things. And um, so that I would say that's that's the biggest changes. 
Do you, do you think kind of on the defense side, do you think it depends on the referees that are refereeing the game and the type of game that it is, whether it's a kind of a preseason game, whether it's conference game or kind of a kind of a mid-major or a championship game? Do you think it kind of evaluates into that? I think it depends that? on how you coach and what your culture is and your style. I made the mistake um, a few years back when I was a head coach at Nyack College. We were always a very aggressive and one of the top defensive teams in the league and in the country. And when they started to change the rules – I adjusted, like most coaches, to what we did per how the rules were. And we took a major step back. And in the following season, I said, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna still stay true. We're going to you know, change some things in terms of how we do it, but we're not going to like placate to these rule changes and then take away our aggressiveness because that's kind of what the rules do. It kind of takes, takes away your aggressiveness. So I think it really determines – what really determines the calls is how consistent you are with your style of play. You know, so like we told our guys the other day, we're not going to change per the rules. We're going to still be aggressive, but we got to do it from the jump ball till the last buzzer. What happens is if you're not aggressive to start the game, then the game's called a certain way. Right. So now when you start being aggressive, now it looks like you're fouling. <laughs> you know, Makes where, sense. If you yeah. come out the gates and you're a physical and you're an aggressive team, a la Baylor, okay, mm -hmm. super aggressive, and everyone complains they foul so much, but they're aggressive the entire game. game. You and can't it doesn't call really that for 40 right. minutes. You know, they look the part, they play the part, they act the part, they execute the part for 40 minutes. An international mm -hmm. champion is playing a very aggressive brand of basketball. And that's, to me right now, the model of tough defense. And it shows you that you don't have to just change your style of play. You just got to be consistent with how you do it and try to teach your kids to try to show their hands and just be – technically sound and how they, you know, pursue being aggressive. And I was saying, because we, we played Baylor last year, and, yeah, and yeah. I was telling, I said the way that they were playing against oh, yeah. Gonzaga is exactly how they played against us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tough defense, mm -hmm. four, you know, guards mm -hmm. going off the drip. Like, that's exactly – so they they are who they are. Yes. And so yes. that's that's why – that's one of the reasons why I was like, you know, Baylor, they probably can do it. I didn't think they was going to do it like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was – that wasn't a game, Coach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was not a game, but – yeah. You know, shout out, shout out to them. But yeah, no, I also with the evolution of the game. Would you say the way you recruit, like the player you're recruiting, mm. kind of changes? I mean, obviously, you know, inside, like the um, you know the heart and stuff, you want that to yeah. kind of stay the same. But you know, would you say maybe 2006, you were like, hey, if we got a six eight guy, we want him doing this skill set versus now that same six eight kid, you would look for a different skill set. That's a great question. I think that it really depends on how you kind of label your positions. You know, like, so traditionally people played with two forwards, you know, um, maybe a power forward and a five and a, and a five man, a center, you know, we've, we've adjusted. I'm a four guard guy. So I, I kind of call my four a four guard, mm -hmm. you, you know, and my five is kind of power forward. So who is a power forward for somebody else is a five for us. And who's a three for somebody else is a four guard for us to give us a chance to play four guards. So I think I don't really think that the players change in how we recruit. I think the labels have evolved to kind of help us identify what's the best fit for what we're trying to do offensively. With that being said, we want to get the best players we can possibly get, even if that means taking something that doesn't exactly fit how we want to play. And then we just figure it out. You know, at the end of the day, it's Maryland Eastern Shore. We're not Duke. We're not Villanova. We're not North Carolina. We can't always have our pick. <laughs> you know, so sometimes you got to recruit as hard as you possibly can, and then take advantage of the best players that you can get, and then try to figure it out. Right. How kind of has the recruiting process been for you, especially with kind of COVID going on, or not playing um, basketball this season, um, but hopefully next season we're playing and we're, we're getting back into the swing of things. But how's been the recruiting process for you over the kind of last year? and a half, especially with not playing? I think that's a two-layer question. The first layer of that question is this time last year, we were on the same playing field as everybody else. Everybody else was getting shut down. Everybody else was having to resort to Zoom recruiting, you know, doing everything via the web, you know, and FaceTime and all things like that. So everybody was in the same playing field. I think we did an amazing job of outworking staffs and being as creative as we possibly could on our Zoom calls and trying to give kids interactive experiences that they weren't getting with everybody because everybody wasn't putting that type of work in. So we were able to kind of bring in some talent, and, and we achieved. We got you know some All-American all junior college guys, a top 100 junior college player, and I thought we brought in a pretty good class, all things, you know, with, with what we were going up against. This year was a new challenge because, you know, now we're going up against – um, the fact that we didn't play this year. 
So that's being used against us in some ways, <laughs> you know, and, and now that's a different hurdle to get over. And it's been a challenging one, you know, and I think that what we're trying to do is, is, is stay as actively involved with the kids that, that we really like, uh, let them know that we do intend on bringing basketball back, um, that we do have our hands all, all around how we're doing our testing and, and everything, and our, our guys were safe and, and uh, you know, and they're, they're still working out and they're still excited and they're still ready to get back to it. And uh, we're going to take advantage of having our kids up in the summertime. So we're promoting that in terms of having summer school on campus again this summer and having our players here to practice. So it's been a huge challenge. People have tried to use it against us, but I'm a grinder. I'm from New York. We're going to grind, and we're going to try to find the best way to figure it out and put together a good recruiting class to keep pushing this thing forward. But not playing this year has been a major challenge in that regard. Absolutely. So... As far as you spoke earlier about uh, traveling and, you know, you've traveled around as far as in your coaching travels, uh, with all of that, what would you say is one of your most memorable games mm. as a home game and then on the road? Ooh, man, that's that's a tough one because I've probably had so many dynamic experiences. Um, so I'll kind of break it up into pockets. <laughs> and, totally okay. And That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> playing St. Joe's at home when they had Jameer Nelson, Delonte West, <laughs> and uh, and we were playing in the old pavilion and it was packed out and it was going crazy. It was like old school, like throwback, you know, 2004, <laughs> just basketball smash mouth in your face on ESPN2. <laughs> you know, oh, like, yeah. And they got us at, at our place, and then we went and got them at their place. Um, the, those games, those that they call it the Holy War, because <laughs> schools, schools are like five miles apart from each other. Right. So the St. Joe's rivalry at Villanova was special, um, especially when they had Jameer and Delonte. Yeah, they could um, play. Going to the Naval Academy, playing Army yes. was, yeah. was yeah. cool. Yeah. You're playing on CBS. Um, it, it's, it's a, you're playing for a trophy. You know, like it's, it's, a, it's like a championship game in itself. You could be having a terrible season, but you beat Army and get the trophy. Right. And all is well yeah, you're good. <laughs> for that you're good. week. So those games were special. Um, at Nyack, we had an incredible rivalry versus a school called Dominican College, which was like literally like up the street. It, they were our rivals. We beat them in a championship 20 years ago when I played there. So it's always – it was the same coach from when I played. So it was always just like a packed out small Division two game that just was crazy and a lot of fun. Um, and I think, you know, in the G League, it was interesting. We played a, a game um, against the Houston Rockets G League team, and they had – it was like school day. <laughs> and, and we didn't realize what we were getting ourselves into when we got there. Like the Oh, L <laughs> no. I already – oh. It was like an early game, so it was like a weird – you used to playing like evening games. This game was like at like 12 o'clock. And so we're kind of thinking like, you know, when we get out there, and they just got like a million sixth graders out there going crazy. And it was like – wild <laughs> it was like wild and it was a funky time we ended up winning the game um but yeah that was that was a that was just interesting one <laughs> and playing at howard last year yeah playing at howard with the band and the cheerleaders and it's a small tight gym no ac it's hot it's like you know what I mean? it's like pretty cool vibe so i know i gave you a lot but i, I think there's so many different yeah. experiences that that um you know that i've been a part of that have been pretty cool Right. Do you have one that's a home game for us that's here on the shore that you've kind of experienced over your, your one year of playing? I think the game where we came out and just put the shellacking on Bethune-Cookman, um, you know, we came out ready to play. Um, they came in. They were like third in the league at that time. And uh, I think we played FAMU after that. But that, that game against Cookman, we came out pressing. We were turning them over. We were up like 17-2. to two, And then we just kept the pedal on the <laughs> to the metal. And the fans were feeling it. Um, our guys got a lot of uh, momentum off that game, was feeling good about themselves, and I think that game was huge. And then it led to the FAMU game, and then we got some more fans in attendance, and, and that was a pretty cool part of the season last year. So that that was a cool game for us. And, and then after there, the, half the team, I think, got COVID. We didn't realize what it was. Right. <laughs> yeah. At the time. We were down in North Carolina. And guys in the huddle like, hey, I can't breathe well. And I'm like, what kind of flu is this? <laughs> you know, like, like, we didn't know at that time until weeks later, months later, that we might have had three or four guys that had COVID. Right. You know, and just thought it was a common cold, you yeah. know, at that time. So, but yeah, that home game versus Cookman, 
as the kids say, that was lit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the reason I groaned so hard when you said school day, we we played against, <laughs> yo, we played against Winthrop, uh, like the 18, 19 year. We playing Winthrop. The game, I think, was either like 11 a.m. or like noon. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, why are they playing? But we thinking maybe they're playing early. It was like Christmas break. You said sixth graders. They had <laughs> third and fourth grade. Yeah. So yeah, everybody's yeah. got that high yep, pitch. Yep, yep, yep. Ah, yeah, 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 Like, yeah. it was packed. And um, I remember right before the game started, they played uh, Drake. The, uh, in my feel- It was In My Feelings. Okay. Kiki, Do You yeah, Love Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't I could think of the me. name. Of so- it's In My Feelings. <laughs> they played that right before the game started. Wow. I've, I've never been in a gym that loud. I've never yeah, been yeah, in a gym yeah. that loud. It was crazy. Because Winthrop I mean, Winter don't have a really big yeah, gym, yeah, yeah. so it was like... That's all, all of those in one space. High pitched, like it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like right in your ear. I was like, it was crazy. So when you said school day, I was like, oh no. But that's that's got to be interesting playing in a crowd of you know younger people for sixth grade compared to playing you know to an older crowd or even a college crowd. That's got to be kind of different environment for yeah, both yeah. the coaching staff and the players. Oh yeah, definitely different. Hey, at Texas, at Texas, uh, yeah. problem. <laughs> at Texas is a problem. <laughs> we played at Texas once at Navy. That was a problem. And at Pitt, Pitt they don't have no manners out there. <laughs> Just no oh, we, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No manners. Shout out to Pitt. Yeah, Pitt I is, mean, but Pitt their is, fans, their fans out there. Pitt, I mean, they were wild. ruthless. They they were picking on the uh, <laughs> they were right there on the court picking on the players yeah. like right there they are right behind you <laughs> yeah, on like, like, like yeah. picking on the players they knew whose people's sisters were they were calling oh they did out. research yeah, yeah. oh god I'm talking Jeez. about fans that actually like live it like like go All to right. sleep at night and were Google you know get like who guy. are you <laughs> <laughs> and they just you did know. that they did that for like I mean we were there maybe that could you imagine if you know. Duke is there? Yeah. Like, yeah, what, what, yeah, you know, yeah. so, yeah, man. Crazy. But, but, yeah. Duquesne's got, Duquesne's gym, they, Duquesne they're kind of, they're kind of right on you, too. Yeah, it wasn't as loud good. as Pitt, but, like, yep. Duquesne, it, their gym is pretty tight. And so, um, yeah, man, it's always, the, I think it's always those, those small gyms yep. that get you, mm-hmm. that really, like, you know, kind of just brings the. Rutgers the, gets a little crazy. Be- it, rack, it brings the know? best and yeah. worst mm-hmm. out of the fans. I think that's what it is. So, yeah. Yep. You know, Very I think cool. We, we've all so had let's that. let's go back, like way back, college days. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're at a place of higher learning, Absolutely. higher education. At HBCU, of course, you didn't attend the HBCU, but you did graduate from college. You got a communications degree um, from <laughs> yeah. Nyack <Nyot> College. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I, I'm cheesy and I'm just gonna live with it. Yeah, I can't. I know, man. Hey, I hey, can't I'm help not, it. I'm do what not, you I'm do, not man. Part of I can't help it. Grad family. I'm, I'm a guy to be. No, honest. listen. I, I, I always <laughs> look. I, I like to mess with people sometimes and say, "Oh man, you you couldn't handle it." You can handle it. You well, you're here I mean? now. You're here I want now, but kind of talk about your kind of your college experiences related to kind of your major um, communications degree, broadcast kind of kind of journalism, sports, radio, TV, um, and how that relates to your everyday job now. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the cool things about my college, even though it wasn't the HBCU, <laughs> right? just messing, just it was the most diverse Christian college in the country. So it was right outside of New York City, and it it it, it really looked like you know. Um, a melting pot you know we had it was a really just like cool experience because you just you got a chance to engage with every all cultures and um that and being so close to New York City in in junior old doing radio was pretty cool because you had an opportunity to get internships and and just be exposed to just New York City media and all that type of stuff um so real fun experience I had a radio show called the truth at night so my nickname at basketball was the truth and so we, we started a show called The Truth at Night. So from see, 10 o'clock. See, Paul, Paul Pierce was your, see, Paul Pierce jacked you, dog. <laughs> I used Paul, to have a jersey that said you know the truth and everything. Paul Pierce <laughs> took your name, dog, because, like, go ahead, man. Yeah, go ahead. You know I'll tell you the story how I got that name. But but um, we had a, a show, and we used to do the old school at midnight. So we used to do, like, a sports radio talk from, like, 10 o'clock to about 11.30, and then we would have some guests come on, and then at midnight we would start throwing the old school jams on. Okay. Barry White, the, the old yeah. school stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luther Vandross, all right, a little shy, you know, Temptations. And we do the old school at midnight radio show. And we'd have people call in and request and things like that. And then my teammates, when we would do, um, we would have guests, 
I had a, a we would just we would have, it weren't real guests, but we'd have somebody with a Jamaican accent coming in act like they were Patrick Ewing. We're like we got Pat Ewing back in, be like yeah, man, you know, like, like you, know, <laughs> you know, we would just we would just we would just have a lot of fun um, and try to see if we could like you know mimic voices of different yeah. people. When one of my boys came in and act like he was Mike Tyson one time, and yeah, we'd be like yeah. yo, we got Mike in the building, we got yo, Mike, yo, you know, like, just enjoying you, it, man. Yeah, yeah, very man. cool. So we had a lot of fun. I think going to a small school like that and doing broadcasting. Um, you get a chance to kind of get on the radio fast, you know. So I, for four years, I was – sometimes at big schools, you got to wait mm-hmm. till like, your junior or senior year. Like, I was able to have a radio show for four whole years. So I had a chance to kind of just work on that craft and be in the studio. And I still got, like, 100 of the cassette tapes from back right. then. There you know, we go. You had, you know, cassette tape stuff. So that, that that's, that's kind of how we did it. Very so, cool. So where did the nickname come from? Though? Yeah. The truth. All where right. did the truth come from? <laughs> so come the truth um, – there was this this show, not to say a show, there was a movie called Heaven is a Playground. Mm-hmm. Way back, used to come on TNT all the time in the 90s. And me and my little brother used to watch it all the time. He used to come on, and it had this guy named The Truth. I forget his first name. The Truth Harris was like this this basketball player in it. My younger brother would come to my basketball games, and he just started calling me The Truth, like the guy from the movie. He's like, yo, he's like The Truth Harris, The Truth Harris, The Truth Harris. <laughs> and, it just, and then my teammates would be like, yo, why is he called you The Truth Harris? I was like, oh, some movie. And he just started calling me The Truth. <laughs> you know? So that's kind of how, wow. how it came out. And then it just kind of exploded into like, then I started getting these jerseys with The Truth on the back. And then my basketball profile had Jason The Truth crafted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah, oh. it became like a... It became like a marketing thing. There we go. <laughs> so Paul Pierce was not the originator. He just kind of halfway popularized it. I don't even know if in that time, if it I think if it was, it was it, the same exact time when that when that was happening that he was the truth in like two thousand, two thousand. Yeah, I think it was I think it was like right around that time. Like yeah, it was yeah. when the Lakers was winning championships and yeah, then he yeah. came out there yeah, yeah. and gave them buckets and that's when Shaq <laughs> gave him the name. Yeah. So, so I don't um, know who the original truth is. But yeah, Paul but Pierce. You, Paul you, Pierce, you got there's another truth. <laughs> right, just letting you know, just letting you know. All That's right. what's up, man. That's what's up, man. So <laughs> radio shows at night, truth on the basketball court. Listen, <laughs> there we go. You know but I mean? then, and then let, let's fast forward to to present day. You, mm-hmm. you get the opportunity. We're not playing basketball, obviously, for COVID nineteen reasons. So that gives you the opportunity to kind of be an analyst um, with collegeinsider.com dot com for the March Madness tournament. Kind of tell us how about how that kind of of, uh, opportunity came about kind of what that experience was like covering all those games oh man it was pretty cool um because i had did the g league broadcasting and 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 uh so it just kind of happened um just from you know just some of that exposure and uh it was pretty cool just to kind of just you know i wanted to stay active in the game you, you know so not playing this year i still wanted to kind of keep that edge kind of stay active in it and and those those Broadcasting or whatever you call it, or analyst things, where it gave me a chance to watch game film, prepare, you know, and, and put out comments or quotes or images or videos or anything just to, to, to give some type of perspective. And it kind of just kept me active in it. So those were fun, you know, to give a little pregame analysis, you know, to support my Villanova boys, and everybody thought they were going to get knocked out early. <laughs> you know? Oh, I picked Winthrop. I'm not going to lie, I picked Winthrop. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, <laughs> To, and, and a great tournament. I think also what was cool about it was a great tournament. You know, I think it was a lot of uh, household names, but then you had some new names. You know, you had teams like Oral Roberts and Abilene Christian and and uh, Houston coming back on the fold. And Kelvin Sampson was a guy that um, I've known for over the years. He worked USA Basketball 20 years ago and had a chance to get to know him, so it was really cheering him on. And uh, I had a lot of fun with it. And, and uh, you know, it, it goes back to my roots in terms of what I did in college. So anytime I get a chance to be a part of – any type of broadcasting or analyst type stuff or jumping on Talk to Shore, <laughs> I, I look forward to it. So you get the the March Madness out of the way. You're kind of doing the same type of kind of analyst broadcasting thing for your, your former uh, employer at the G League of, of the 76ers out of Philly. Kind of what's that experience like? Um, it's a little, I guess, larger of a scale, a um, little larger of a production. Um, but what's been what's been that like for you? Well, with the G League experience, we got a chance to do the 15 G League games in a bubble. And with D. Lonham, who's like a pro, and she worked for the Sixers for a long time and did a lot of the sideline uh, reporting for them. And that was cool because we did pregame, halftime, and postgame. So you were kind of prepping for the pregame stuff, and then you were kind of 
watching the game and, and, and then being ready for halftime and being able to talk about adjustments and then having your post-game thoughts. So that, that was exciting, and that was the first time I had a chance to do something like that. And then what I'm doing with the Sixers is more pre-game and, and, and different matchups related. And, and so it's just been a fun time doing all that stuff and just being able to reconnect with those people, great organization. It's like family there, so um, it's just a lot of fun. And, and I enjoy just meeting different people and staying close to the game in a season where we didn't play. So it just kind of keeps me, it keeps my edge. <laughs> there we go. And uh, from your time with the G League, uh, how many of those guys have, you know, been ch- been able to get to the 76ers and kind of work their way in the rotation or make it to the active roster? Yeah, I think Shake Milton is probably the one that everyone kind of, you know, um, mentions and, mm-hmm. and sees because he had a, he was on that two-way um, uh, contract last year. And uh, actually, was he a two-way or was he – I don't remember if he was two-way. He two may have way. made it all the way to the active. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Guy. He was, he, yeah. you know, I don't think he was a two-way guy when we were with him. Um, but he was injured in preseason. He was a late draft pick. Might have been the second or the last pick in the draft. And uh, he's the guy that that really shined. He shined in the G League, took advantage of that opportunity, and got himself to be a rostered guy. And then from a rostered guy to a, a key player off the bench, mm-hmm. and then a guy that's pushed to start some nights, you know. So yeah. I think he had like 15 or 16 the other night. So he, yeah. he's... He's grown a lot. He's the main guy that I think has done great things. Novell Pell was a big kid that mm-hmm. um, ended up on the Sixers roster last year. And then this season has floated around a little bit. He's been with uh, Sacramento. Um, he's been with New York, and he's been with Brooklyn. So those are the two guys that I think um, that I worked with that spent some time in the G League and, and now are on NBA rosters. Got you. And so you talked about you doing your pro- broadcast with the Sixers and also with the uh, NCAA March Madness Tournament, but also you have your own podcast yeah, that yeah. you uh, <laughs> kind of was able to curate uh, along with uh, Coach Bachelor mm-hmm. of the women's team. So uh, uh, how did that come about and, you know, what kind of things have you been able to talk about on that podcast? Yeah, you know, it was interesting when the season got canceled, You know, the shock factor, (laughs) you know, hit hard. And those initial days as you're kind of like in in a little kind of mini depression, you know, just kind of, you know, going through it, you know, a lot of different emotions. And then at some point you got to pick your head up and say, okay, what are we going to do here? You you know, so cultivate a plan for our players, you know, in terms of how we're going to do things for them in terms of different Zoom sessions, bringing speakers in. Um, as you know, we had Kyle Lowry come in and speak to the team and a lot of just motivational people come in and, and share things. So we created a plan for them. And then I said, okay, what am I going to do for me <laughs> to keep me motivated too? And that's when the idea in my mind came of, of uh, one, taking a grad school class, which I did. Um, and uh, shout out to Dr. Caldwell. <laughs> All right. And the other thing was, what can I do? How can I use my degree? You know, I had already done some broadcasts and I had done some podcasts in the past, but I was like, I want to kind of get active and doing some broadcasting stuff. And then I started to thinking about, okay, we had the Hawk Talk last year. Mm-hmm. So how, how can we kind of spin off of that into a season of not playing and have some type of coaches something? You know, and that's when I went across the hall, not a far walk to see if, <laughs> if Coach B. Bachelor would be on board. And he's always cool. He's like, hey, if you think it'll be cool, I'm in. You know, so yeah. started talking a little bit and got a great. Uh, Linda Cray Media and Mark Fredo and those guys. And Shout then, out to Mark Fredo. He yeah, just had a kid yeah. like the other day, so congrats to him. Yeah, he yeah, got a baby. Congrats to him. And uh, started talking to those guys and just throwing out different ideas. And then Mark kind of made it come to life. So when we kind of went to administration and Keith Davidson and, and Stan and, and Sean and, and to Raylan and you guys. And it was kind of like put together based off the ideas. And we've had some fun with it. Had some great guests come on from my coaching background. Uh, Fred's had some great guests come on. We've had some engaging talks about social injustice and as well. Um, and just have had a lot of fun. So it's not just basketball. It's a little bit of everything. So Hone Your Craft Podcast. If you haven't seen it, man, check it out. It's episode 5 coming out in a couple of weeks, man. There we go. There you go. <laughs> and uh, you were talking about kind of the your podcast has kind of spoke to social social injustice. Um, and, you know, if with, you know, like we were talking earlier, too many to name. It feels like every day is, there's a new thing, and you having a team, young young black men, yep. for, you know, for the most part, and um, just how do you use kind of what is going on outside of these walls and what they see in the country, and help them, you know, help use the game of basketball, you know, to like bring them together, and then you know, but still let knowing that hey, I see what's going on, and that you know, we're with you 
no matter what, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of goes on out there. I think being at an HBCU, I wouldn't say we have an easier um, task, but it is a little bit more um, – in front of them, you, you know, yeah. like it's a little bit, they're more, a little bit more aware, you, you know, so and it's a little bit co- more comfortable climate for us to be able to have these conversations um, because they, they, they're they experiencing it with their brothers on a daily basis. They're hearing the stories that, you know, it's a diverse campus, so it's not something that's, that they're blind to, mm-hmm. you know, so I think it's, it's, and I think being at the HBCU, not just within our coaching and our team, they have brothers on their own campus that can relate to them. They have teachers that can relate to them. And they're getting a cultural experience here where people can relate to them and understand what they're going through um, as young black males in this society. Um, and so I think it makes it even more powerful and dynamic time to be a part of the HBCU. Um, I've enjoyed uh, the conversation we've had with our players. They've been very open. We've been very transparent about things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, it's been exciting to see some of the progress that the country's making you know, over this past year. You, you know, even in the when you see some of these recent coaches hires, 25 African-American coaches have been hired in head coaching positions. Right. You know, that's the most <laughs> ever, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and that's just in basketball. So and you see what's going on in terms of how the NBA did um, halftime and, and mm-hmm. pregame and stuff and including HBCUs. We got to get Maryland Eastern Shore name out there. We you have know? to. I think that's <laughs> a great <laughs> idea. Absolutely. You know, so I think that. Um, across the board, there's so many special things going on. I think our guys are aware of it. I think our institution's done a great job, too, of kind of making T-shirts and just putting different quotes out and, and just having different speakers come on and speak to these kids um, uh, through the student-athlete series. They've been, Not student-athlete, the student forum they've had, and they've just mm-hmm. had different people on virtual Zooms uh, speaking to the campus. So um, I don't want to get too long-winded on it, but I think it's a special time, and we take a lot of pride in, in educating our players about what's going on out there. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I know for me personally, I kind of I hate that I got a little numb to yeah, all of the yeah, stuff that's yeah. kind of going on. But I, I feel like, uh, you know, the conversation is if it wasn't being had, it definitely started happening like yeah. a year ago. And so I think that that is the first step. Of, yeah, the, yeah. of the progress. You know, who's kind of talking about Jackie Robinson earlier, you mm-hmm. know, like he was the first one. And then you know, kind of the floodgates open and more and more and we progress. And then, you know, like the game of baseball, it probably could be a little better. Social justice, you know, all that yeah, could be a little better, but you have to get a start. And so I, I feel like, uh, you know, not to, you know, not to be long-winded going into exactly what happened as far as in Minnesota and mm-hmm. wherever, wherever else around the country, just knowing that more than just quote-unquote, our community, the black community, is aware yeah, of yeah. what's going on. And I yeah. think that's I think that's that's very key and very vital to uh, just the country overall, yeah, seeing yeah. steps. Uh, I really do. And so hopefully uh, hopefully we can continue to grow from it. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's that's my only uh, – the only thing I, I think is I just, I just want the country and everybody to continue to grow and hopefully, you know, we can – Continue to have things better. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, as, it's as not. A, I think it's not even just the black community too. It's the Asian community. Yeah, it's absolutely. all the same thing. A whole bunch of different demographics of people. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Hopefully things get better and then things kind of start to change and kind of get better over time. And you know, peace on earth. Yeah. For yeah once. I mean, well, I think what's interesting is, and this was, I think, like Good Morning America. Someone was saying something like, if you, if you. If for some reason you weren't as aware of you sh- as you should have been in 2018, there's no way you can't be aware exactly. in 2021. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the way I took that was was that it's been so – this is the longest of consistency that it's been out, you know, that yeah. it's been out in the, in the forefront. And um, so anybody that, that didn't that, – that, that was oblivious to it or wasn't paying as much attention, you better be paying attention Yeah, now. you know now. <laughs> you, know, you know, so – and uh, but it, but it's cool, man. I I just I'm all about peace. I'm all about love for everybody and just everyone coming together. So and um, and hopefully we can just continue to do that, you know, as a people. No doubt. So didn't play this year that like we talked about, but you know, the plan is to play uh, this upcoming school year. So in your opinion, kind of, I know it's weird time and, you know, some of the players still haven't actually played for the Hawks yeah, yet, yeah, yeah. but, you know, based on what you're kind of seeing and what you, what you feel, what can we expect, you know, and what are you looking to see, uh, this upcoming season, uh, out of your guys? Man, we have so many roster spots to fill right now. Um, and so much growth to still do as a program, 
it's kind of hard to pinpoint that. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'd like us to be able to do is just to kind of um, continue to make strides forward in how we were defended in that first year. You know, I think we finished that first year and broke the school record in shot blocks. You know, one of the better teams in the MEAC uh, defensively rating-wise, third mm -hmm. or fourth. Um, and, and we were able to do some things defensively. They said, okay, that's, that's, that's clearly what they're trying to do. And I think that's on par with what I've been as a during my head coaching tenure um, over the last eight or nine years. So we want to try to just continue to push that, that narrative forward while um, growing as an offensive program too because that's been an area that Maryland Eastern Shore historically has just not gotten done. Right. Scoring has been a problem. So we're trying to get our players that we have better, um, and we're trying to also add more skill to the program as well. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be, and, and we're kind of back to square one a little bit right now. So stick with us. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. So we hear from the kind of the player side and kind of what you're expecting out of the coaches and whatnot. What are you expecting from the fans when the fans can come back, um, hopefully into Heights Arena and whether it's you know virtual, um, you know watching the games online or in person? What are you expecting from Incredible them? Incredible energy for having a chance to be back, you know, in, in the arena cheering on your Hawks. And patience <laughs> as we're going to be a work in progress. But I think we're going to have some good kids that are going to be passionate about getting this thing back on track and, uh, you know, give them support as they try to go out there and push hard and push through, you know, being, you know, having a tough year in, in terms of not being able to play and then trying to recover from that, you know, um, and getting those competitive juices going is going to be a some time for that to, you know, still catch up and, and get back going with those things. So, um, that's it. Have energy and be patient. <laughs> right. I think I think it's important to note and something that I guess a positive side for us is for student athletes across all of our sports that we have here on the shore. Um, if they were injured or you know needed to catch up on a class, they have a year to not physically be in the game of whatever sport they're in and they can recover and come back. So I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be a really good year on the shore next year as far as all of our teams, baseball, golf, basketball, you know, a whole bunch of different teams. Yeah, I, I think it's an exciting time because it kind of feels like, you know, it's like we like gumbo. We've just been sitting and <laughs> sitting, but now but that first bite is always good. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I, I think that's – that's a positive for us, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, Coach, thank you for, for coming through. Um, like I said, you're a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, gave us a little a little bit of your time today, so we want to thank you. Before we let you go, uh, where can the good people follow you on uh, social media, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you're at? This yeah, is your where time. can the good people find you? Let them know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'm trying to think if I even know my social media. Is, uh, Twitter is at J J Craft 4 J-C-R-A-F-T-4. Mm. And then I think uh, Instagram is J underscore C-R-A-F-T-4. Or just follow Langston Frazier, and he's got all types of cool stuff out there. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you can do that, too. As always, <laughs> we'll uh, tag the coach's social media under uh, in the description below. So if you, you don't know where to find him, we'll make it easy for you and do it for you. Absolutely. So, Coach, thank you for coming through. Appreciate you guys. All right. So... Well, Talking about social, we'll plug ours. Yeah, uh, plug ours. <laughs> Ray underscore law 12 on Twitter. R underscore ward law on Instagram. Uh, Raylan ward law on LinkedIn and Facebook. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Langston Frazier. You can find me on LinkedIn at Langston Frazier. You can also follow me on my other podcast, Langston Frazier Show. New episodes coming soon. Um, and speaking of other episodes and podcasts, Holy Your Craft Podcast with Jason Crafton himself and Fred Bachelor. Episode five, as he said, is coming out soon. But if you're waiting, uh, episode four is out now. You can just visit our Facebook page and all that information is right there. Absolutely. And always, always follow the Hawks um, in everything we do with all sports on EasternShoreHawks.com. Also on ES Hawks. Uh, on Instagram, ES Hawk Sports on Twitter. Each team has their own Twitter. You can find them from there. And also email us at mdtalkshore at gmail.com. Join in on the conversation by using the hashtag TalkShore. Yeah. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We're on Google, Anchor, Apple, um, geez, Spotify, wherever you can find your favorite podcasts. That's where you can find us. You can also find us on YouTube. Just search Talk of the Shore podcast on YouTube, and you can see all of the 19 episodes that we have out. Oof, 
It's been a grind, man. We've been a grind. We're getting there. It's been a grind for sure. We're for getting sure. there. We have to- oh, but but here's here's one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, shout out to our athletic uh, our athletic staff. Marilisha Shore partnered with Route One Apparel and came out with these brand new fantastic masks, uh, kind of to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen. Each coach got to pick out masks for their team, um, for their student athletes, um, and our coaching staff and all the administrators. So if you want to um, get your mask, go to routeoneapparel.com. Here's mine. It says the shore. There's other two or three, four other ones you can go on the website and look. If you want to zoom in, that's what it looks like. But Jason Crafton's got another one on too. He's got the black one with the big old M on it. So there you go. If you want to check those out, Route One Apparel um, and appreciate the partnership with uh, the local uh, Maryland brand. Absolutely. And as always, we have been all tested for COVID. That is true. And uh, negative. A uh, couple of us, you know, a couple shots in. A couple shots in. But socially distant. Everybody is good to go as far as COVID-19 right. is concerned. Right. Shout out to our in-studio crew, Mr. Ruffy behind the cameras today. Joseph Birds in the director seat. Uh, Mr. Lewis is always in the audio position. Um, but yeah, shout out to all y'all. We appreciate y'all um, for being here as always. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, yeah, I'm really we'll camera low. four, yeah. <laughs> oh, we can, can we get camera can four? Can we get again? sky cam today? Can, can we, we, can we do cam? that? Ah, like, yeah, there, there we is. go. There it is. And as always, I'm Raylan Wardlaw. I'm Langston yeah. Frazier. Folks, we'll see you next week on Talk of the Shore. Thank you for listening. Peace.